The last of the classical assay techniques that we want to discuss in the lecture part of the course is complexometric titration, which is the technique that underpins our EDTA titrations, like we used for water hardness in lab. In general, EDTA titrations mechanically, in terms of determining an analyte's concentration, are not really significantly more complex than any other type of titration. EDTA titrations, though, because of the complexity of EDTA as a ligand, are underpinned by a lot of significant calculations and conceptual material that need to be established when you design an assay to determine the concentration of a metal ion with EDTA. So the way the lecture material is going to work is in terms of determining the concentration of an analyte using EDTA titration, we're just going to kind of take it as read that you guys understand generally how titrations work by this point. But we're going to talk initially about how EDTA works as a chelator, how EDTA works as a ligand. And then we're going to talk about some of the math that we need to use that draws upon the acid-base chemistry that we've been talking about to explain how you really design an EDTA titration that's going to work. And then we're going to close by talking about some key technical points that we didn't address so much when we ran the EDTA titrations in lab. So EDTA is an example of a ligand. A ligand is a Lewis base which binds to metal ions or atoms by donating a pair of electrons to form a new covalent bond to the metal center. Thus, any Lewis base can be a ligand. And in general, in Gen Chem 2, we defined a ligand or a Lewis base as a nonmetal with a pair of electrons to donate to form a bond. So for instance, cyanide, Cn minus, is an example of a ligand, is an example of a Lewis base, because there are lone pairs on the carbon and the nitrogen, either of which can be donated into empty orbitals on the metal center and form a covalent bond with a metal. EDTA, as we're going to see, is also a ligand, where we have lone pairs on the oxygen atoms, lone pairs on the nitrogen atoms that can be donated to a metal or metal ion and form covalent bonds. Cyanide, though, is what we call a monodentate ligand, while EDTA is called a hexadentate ligand, because ligands are further classified by the number of bonds they form to a metal. A monodentate ligand, or a monodentate Lewis base like cyanide, only donates one lone pair, to a metal center and forms a single covalent bond, because of the size of the molecule and its geometry, EDTA, a hexadentate ligand, actually can donate six separate electron pairs to form six new covalent bonds to a metal center. As a result, we refer to as we refer to EDTA as a hexadentate ligand, where the hexa portion indicates that it can form six covalent bonds to the Lewis acid that it is binding to. Dentate, in this case, comes from the Greek word for teeth, and it's making an analogy to the ligand biting at the metal center or chomping down on the metal center. So hexadentate fundamentally means EDTA can form six new covalent bonds when it binds to a metal ion, and this is key to the chemistry of EDTA titrations and how we use EDTA to determine the concentration of metals in a given sample. In terms of a balanced chemical equation, the typical equilibrium reaction that describes how Lewis bases bind to Lewis acids to form complexes or complex ions works like this. So if we take a typical example of metal ion like iron 2 plus, and we say we're going to bind one mole of cyanide to one mole of iron 2 plus, we say that the metal ligand complex, also known as a complex ion that forms, is going to be an iron 2 cyanide complex ion where the charge on the overall ion is plus 1 because the charge on the iron was plus 2. Charge on the cyanide is minus 1, so the charge has reduced by 1. And now the iron has formed a covalent bond to the cyanide, but the whole molecule acts as a single polyatomic ion with a plus 1 charge. In terms of the equilibrium constant for this reaction, we define the equilibrium constant as a special class of equilibrium constant 
just as the way we use KSP to describe ionic compounds breaking down in water, or we use Ka or Kb to describe acid base strengths. We describe the strength of the interaction between the Lewis acid and the Lewis base with a special type of equilibrium constant value that we call a K sub F, or an equilibrium formation constant. In terms of how the equilibrium constant expression looks, exactly the same as any other equilibrium constant that you've seen before, the equilibrium formation constant for this reaction would be the concentration of the product, the iron cyanide complex ion divided by the concentration of the iron and the concentration of the cyanide. Now what makes EDTA so special or what makes multidentate ligands so special is their formation constants are extremely large because the number of bonds that the ligand can form to the metal center determines how likely it is that the ligand is going to release the metal once again. So for instance, you can think about if iron binds to cyanide, and then we have an equilibrium established where the iron cyanide complex ion can back react to reform iron plus two and cyanide minus one, only one covalent bond has to be broken for that to happen. But in the case of EDTA, a hexadentate ligand, which can form six bonds to the metal center, it's extremely thermodynamically unlikely that the EDTA will ever let the, uh, the metal ion go again. Now, statistically, yes, some EDTA molecules have to release that metal ion, but for them to release it, you have to break six covalent bonds that have now formed that metal center. The likelihood of breaking all six of those bonds fast enough to release the metal center back out into the solution is statistically very unlikely. And we refer to this enhanced stability when you have multidentate ligands binding to metal centers as chelation or a chelating effect. And the idea is when your Lewis base can form multiple bonds to metal ion, the complex that's formed is much more stable, and thermodynamically it's very unlikely that the EDTA will release the metal ion back into solution. We have almost we have formed a, an almost perfectly permanent complex between our Lewis acid and our Lewis base because the Lewis acid has been captured at the heart of this six coordinate ligand. So if your ligand can form multiple bonds to a metal, we refer to it as a chelator or a chelating agent. And as a result, multidentate ligands or chelating agents form more stable complexes with metal ions than monodentate or didentate ligands would. In fact, the equilibrium constant, the equilibrium formation constant for EDTA binding to any metal with a plus two or plus three charge generally has a massive value. A typical formation constant for EDTA binding to, say, a divalent metal like manganese or calcium or magnesium is around 10 to the 15th. And if the charge on your metal is even higher, or it's an extremely small plus two cation, this KF value can be even larger around 10 to, 10 to the 25th or 10 to the 27th. And so again, the magnitude of the equilibrium constant here is another mark that the complex that forms between our chelating agent and the metal ion is extremely strong. And our new six, and our six new covalent bonds holding the chelating agent to the metal are extremely unlikely to be broken. So in this module, we are going to discuss the chemistry of EDTA and how we use our existing equilibrium skill set, equilibrium formation constant values, predominant diagrams, systematic treatment of equilibrium, to quantify the concentration of metal ions using EDTA titration. So the way we're going to work through this is we're going to talk in a little more detail about the nature of the bonding that occurs between Lewis acids and bases. We're going to show you how to calculate the concentration of a metal ion in an EDTA solution at different pHs. We are going to show you how to predict the speciation of a hexadentate chelate EDTA at different pHs. We'll talk about how indicators function in complexometric titrations. And we're going to show you how to model EDTA titration curves for metal ions in EDTA solutions applying key assumptions about K sub F values. Your assigned reading for this module is going to be Harris chapter 12. Specifically, you should read sections 12.1 through 12.4 and section 12.6.
in the ninth edition. In older edition of Harris, this chapter moves around a little bit. You may find the EDTA, the complexometric titration chapter, either as chapter 11 or chapter 13.